We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 9 or 11 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, church family. How are you all doing this morning? You're all looking, uh, looking your best. I see all those pretty faces out there. Hey, if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Matt. I serve here at ACC as a lead pastor, and uh, I would love to meet you after service. I usually hang out in the lobby or somewhere out in the parking lot. We can bump fists or shake hands or high five or whatever you want. Uh, I would love to get a chance to meet you. Hey, before we jump into part seven of and the last part of our Wander Years series, I did want to highlight a, a few things. Uh, one, I want to make sure that you all are planning to be here on Sunday October 2nd. And let me tell you why. Sunday, October 2nd is a really big deal around here. We call it Vision Sunday. This week, our overseers have a retreat where we're really kind of looking and asking God to reveal to us our vision for the next year and the next three to five years. And then after that, our executive pastor team goes on a retreat at towards the end of the week. And then next Monday and Tuesday, our staff goes on a visioning retreat. So it's kind of planned in that order. And what happens on the second is we get together as a church and we cast that vision. You get to kind of hear where we're going, what we're doing, and what's coming up in the new year and what's coming up beyond that three to five years. It's going to be a really great Sunday. And if you are in attendance on October 2nd, Vision Sunday, everybody, regardless of if you are a newborn in the nursery all the way up to whatever age uh, we got here, uh, you're going to get a free uh, ACC t-shirt that morning. It's going to be really cool. We'll all be matching. It's going to be so cool. All right, so don't, don't miss out. That's how you get a free shirt. It's a really nice, high-quality shirt. Does it? It's like one of the ones you want to wear over and over again. Don't miss October 2nd, Vision Sunday. Another thing that we're doing to prepare for Vision Sunday, we do this twice a year, and hopefully you got one of these on the way in. These are our biannual church surveys, and these are uh, anonymous, all right, so you don't have to write your name on them. What we do twice a year is we want to gather information from you, the church, right, and to just really kind of know how we're going, how we're doing, how we're growing, and how we're, we're maybe some areas for improvement. And one of the ways we do that is with this survey. If you didn't get one of these on the way in, you can grab one on the way out. And what we ask is that everyone who's an attender, partner, or leader here fill this out one time. All right. If you'd like to give some additional comments or feedback, there's some room, uh, but you don't have to write your name on it. Uh, we, we want you just to give us some feedback, and that's what this is. And on your way out today, drop it in one of the white buckets. Uh, we'll have hosts, uh, and you can drop it in there. You can fold it if you want or leave it unfolded, whatever you want to do, all right? We would love to know how we're doing so on Vision Sunday we can share some of the results. And it's been really cool to watch how God's helped us grow and improve in these many different areas over the years. All right, so we are at that place in our Wander Year series where we're finally going to see the Israelite people walk into the promised land. It's been a long journey, right? Last week we covered that 40 years of wandering and they're kind of lost and not really lost. God's leading them, but they're wandering in the wilderness. And we finally get to the place where at the end of Deuteronomy, in fact, I want to invite you to open up your copy of God's Word to Deuteronomy chapter 31. Deuteronomy 31. And remember, Deuteronomy is essentially uh, towards the end of the wander years. Moses presents really three different sermons. It's kind of right there at the end, and he, he preaches three different sermons, and you get to see that in the book of Deuteronomy. But as you get to the very end of Deuteronomy, you're going to get to the end of Moses' life. The other day, my family, we were driving, and we were stuck in traffic on a freeway. So traffic, of, tr cars weren't moving very quick. But one of the things I noticed is there was a car next to us that had a piece of gum on the tire. And every single time the tire would make a, a single rotation, that gum would hit the ground, and then when it would come back up, you'd see this big string of gum 
and then it would break, and then the tire would go around again. And we, we watched this happen quite a few times, and this understanding of this, this cycle, right, that every time the tire went around, this, this cycle repeated itself. Well, today, what we're going to see here in the end of Deuteronomy, uh, all the way really through Joshua 4, which is the next book in the Bible, we're going to see a cycle that repeats itself across cultural uh, generations. You're going to see one complete revolution of the cycle from the beginning of our series to now. You're going to see one whole complete revolution of the cycle in this series. But you're going to notice that the cycle isn't something that just ended. It's a cycle that repeats over and over again, sometimes many generations until there's a, a complete revolution. Sometimes it happens more quickly. Sometimes it happens more slowly. But you're going to notice that we're in the cycle still today. The cycle is something that we still see today. And I want to show you, if you have your, your notes with you, your little half sheet of notes, the very first part of this cycle of human culture we're going to experience, we're going to see, is, is this, that hard times create strong men. Now, I should say that the reason why I'm using the word men here, number one, I really do feel like this is a specific calling to our men. But specifically, these four points you're going to see today, these are from, from a, a quote from a book by G. Michael Hoff. And so I'm, I'm using the word men because he uses the word men. But this really, you're going to see, applies to both men and women. And the truth is that hard times, when, when a culture finds itself in a difficult season, what's going to come out of that is going to raise up, rise up strong men, strong women. So hard times create strong men. We started this series at this phase of the cycle. Remember, there were some really hard times. When you go all the way back to the book of Exodus, where we started seven weeks ago, you saw that the Israelite people were living in very hard times. They were living under 400 years of oppression in Egypt. Remember, it says in Exodus 1, a stay in Deuteronomy 31, but in Exodus 1, it said that, then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. See, this is a very hard time that the Israelites were in. It says, now go, for I'm sending you, Moses, to Pharaoh. You must lead my people, Israel, out of Egypt. Now, obviously, if you go back to that very first series, that very first message, you remember that Moses was very hesitant at first to rise up as the strong man that God was going to use but here's what we're going to see is that in this series, this season of oppression, God called up some strong men to pull uh, the, the cycle to the next phase. It takes that, that this hard times are going to create strong men. And we see Moses and Aaron, and remember, and Caleb and Joshua, there was 40 years of strong leadership. It was imperfect leadership. Every single one of us, listen, I'm not calling anyone in this room or expecting anyone in this room to, to be perfect because that's not going to happen this side of heaven. Only Jesus can figure that one out. But the truth is that hard times can create strong men, and we see that happen here. And then in Deuteronomy 31, that's where you guys should be. Let's look at the first two verses. It says, when Moses had finished giving these instructions to all the people of Israel. Remember, Deuteronomy is three sermons of instructions. It says, when he had finished giving these instructions to the people of Israel, he said, I am now 120 years old. I am no longer able to lead you. The Lord has told me you will not cross the Jordan River. So here's a quick leadership principle, by the way. If any of you study leadership and you're into leadership, there's going to be seasons in your leadership where you realize you can't. Uh, maybe you're just not able to time-wise, you're not able to talent-wise, you're not able to resource-wise. Take the, the organization, your team, any further. And at that point, you pass the baton on to someone else who can keep moving along. And Moses has arrived at that moment where he says, I know I can't go any further. He's been one of the strong men that the hard times has created, but he recognizes that he can't go any further. And then so it goes on in verses 7 through 9 of Deuteronomy 31. It says, Then Moses called for Joshua 
And all Israel watched. He said to him, be strong. There it is. Remember, weak times create strong men. And Moses calls up Joshua and says, I can't go any further, but I want to encourage you now to be strong and courageous, for you will lead these people into the land that the Lord, that the Lord swore to their ancestors he would give them. You are the one who will divide it among them as their grants of land. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. There's something really powerful about this charge that Moses passes, this, that passes the baton on to Joshua. And he says to him, be strong and courageous and know that you don't have to be afraid of what's on the other side of this river because God is going ahead of you. And that leads me to a, kind of a sub point here is that strong men fear God so that they don't have to fear man. Strong men and strong women, listen, when you fear God, you don't have to and you won't fear other people. It's something that Moses is now saying to, to Joshua, listen, I want you to, to be strong and courageous and know that I, God is going before you. You just fear him. You don't have to worry about anything else that might be coming. So then as it goes on through verses 9 and 12, it says that Moses wrote down this entire book of instruction. I believe that to mean Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's how we know Moses wrote, wrote these books. And so Moses writes this all down, and we see that in 9 through 12. And then he tells the people to read it. You see, it's the second thing. Strong men know God's word so they can teach it to others. If you want to be a strong man of God, if you want to be a strong woman of God, if you want to be a strong uh, child of God, you're going to know God's word so that you can not only apply it to your life, but so that you can teach it to other people. As you keep reading in Deuteronomy 31, verse 13, it says, do this so that your children who have not known these instructions. The, the children, some of them aren't even born yet. They don't know about this, the, the, the whole account of what you just went through. They don't know about it yet. So I want you to, to write it down and to read it. Do this so that your children who have not known these instructions will hear them and will learn to fear the Lord your God. Do this as long as you live in the land you are crossing the Jordan to occupy. You see, time in God's word is crucial for fearing God. It is crucial for obeying his instructions, but it's also crucial that you know God's word so that you can teach it to your children. You can teach it and pass it along to future generations. Another thing we're gonna see here is that strong men work hard so that they can finish well. You see, what's about to happen here is Moses' turn of being a strong man that God is using is about to come to an end. And we see that Moses works hard, works hard so that he can finish well. In verses thir or thir chapter 31, 14, and 16, God comes to Moses and says, Moses, listen, I want you to go up on this mountain, and when you're up there, you're gonna die. I don't know about you, but I don't know if I'd want that specific kind of instruction. Hey, Matt, I want you to go out of the parking lot and then turn right and then you're gonna drop dead. <laughs> but in chapter 32, we see that Moses, he writes a song, and we're gonna come back to that song in just a moment. And then chapter 33, Moses uh, extends a blessing to each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And then in chapter 34, Moses goes up to that mountain that God told him to go up to. He sees the promised land from afar because he's not allowed to cross into it. And then he dies, just the way God said he would. I'm trying to think of the closest thing. I, I, I'm trying to think of an illustration to really explain what it would be like to look at a promised land that you've led people to and not be able to cross into it and experience it. The, the, one of the examples that came to my head was when my dad had found out that he had melanoma skin cancer. And he, he had a really, uh, we knew that his, his days were numbered. The doctor was really clear. You only have a couple months left to live. 
we found out, my wife and I, that we were pregnant with our first daughter. And we knew the timing wasn't going to work out, most likely, unless God intervened in a miraculous way. We knew that likely if all the the timelines worked out the way the doctors said they were going to, that my dad would be able to know that my wife was pregnant with one of his grandchildren, but would never get to actually hold her. That must have been kind of a crummy feeling. And I think that it's probably Moses. He's on the top of this mountain, and he's looking across at the promised land. He's led well as a strong man. He's finished hard. He's finished well. And and now he can't actually cross over. Here's what Deuteronomy 34 verse 5 says. It says, so Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, just as the Lord had said. By the way, when people say that Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, this is how we know that the last four chapters, someone else had to help him out. And Moses dies there at the top of the mountain just the way the Lord had said. I remember um, walking into our bedroom and I saw my wife reading and she was in tears. And sometimes, you know, you read a really good book and a book has the ability to make you laugh out loud. A book has that ability, right, to make you, to get angry, to cry. And I I assume my wife was reading one of those books that just, man, that's that moment where it just makes you weep. And I'm like, what are you reading? What fiction book are you reading? (laughs) My wife was reading Deuteronomy 34. Moses looks across the Jordan River. He sees the promised land. He's finished well, but he never gets to cross over and experience it. And then he dies. See, sometimes your purpose, listen to this, church, sometimes your purpose or one of the purposes that God has for your life will be to prepare others for a blessing that you won't be able to participate in. Sometimes the work that you're doing right now might seem so thankless because you're going to work really, really hard and you're going to pour all you've got into something and at the end of the day, you're not going to see any fruit but your children will. Your grandchildren might. Someone else at at work might get to experience the reward from the hard work that you've put in. But that's just life. And that's what's happening here for Moses. And then it goes on. It says that Moses' burial place is unknown. And here's why Moses' burial place is unknown. This is crazy cool. You ready for this? If you keep reading in Deuteronomy 34, it says that the Lord buried him. No man on this earth can tell you where Moses was buried because no man on earth buried Moses. The Lord buried Moses. It goes on to say that he was 120 years old, right? And that he was strong as ever. In fact, you can actually read Moses' obituary This isn't actually his obituary, all right? They didn't publish like a paper. But if you look at Deuteronomy 34 and you want to see what a strong man looks like, men in this room, women in this room, if you want to go out knowing that you finished strong, at the end of the day, man, I would hope that every one of us in this room could have an obituary this epic. In Deuteronomy 34, verse 10 through 12, it says this, there has never been another prophet in Israel like Moses whom the Lord knew face to face. The Lord sent him to perform all the miraculous signs and wonders in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and in his entire land. With mighty power, Moses performed terrifying acts in the sight of all Israel. That's a pretty cool obituary, isn't it? But here's the problem. Strong men come out of this phase that we call hard times. Hard times are going to develop stronger and stronger men. But 
but there's a, 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 there's a good thing that comes out of this for, for, before we get to the bad thing. The, the good thing is the second phase that strong men create good times. You're going to see this cycle over and over again throughout history that when you have a period of strong men, strong men are going to lead their, their culture, their people into a season of prosperity. And we get to see that. So now Moses is dead, and Joshua has been raised up to lead God's people into the promised land. Now remember I was telling you that that Moses wrote a song before he died. Let me tell you why Moses wrote a song. You see, Moses wrote a song about the truth that times were about to get really good. And then he goes on in the song to show you more of the cycle we're going to get to in a moment. But let me show you some verses about how good things are going to get. In Deuteronomy 31, it says, for I will bring them, this is God speaking to Moses, I will bring them into the land I swore to give their ancestors, a land flowing with milk and honey, and they will become prosperous, eat all the food they want, and become fat. I love that. Here's what he's saying, is that, Moses, you've been strong, You've been a strong man, and Joshua, and Caleb, and Aaron, very imperfect people, but you've been strong, and you've led these people, and now because of your strength, strong men create good times, and and God is saying, you're going to walk across this river in just a little bit, and you're going to be walking into really, really good times. I mean, listen to that. A land flowing with milk and honey And you'll become prosperous and you'll eat all the food you want. And you'll become fat. Then in Moses' song, some of the lyrics of his song show us some of these good times. In Deuteronomy 32, verses 3 and 4, I put this one in NIV because my family memorized this verse. It says, I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Oh, praise the greatness of our God. He is the rock His works are perfect, and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. We talk about just a verse that highlights the goodness of the season they're about to walk into. And then it goes on. That that verse was about God's goodness, but then it talks more about what they're walking into in uh, chapter 32, verse 11. It says, like an eagle that rouses her chicks, and hovers over her young. So he spread his wings to take them up and carried them safely on his pinions. Now remember, we're exploring this verse to see how good things are about to become. You ready? It already says that he rouses his chicks, hovers over them, guards them, and it says the Lord alone guided them. They followed no foreign gods. He let them ride over the highlands and feast on the crops of the fields. He nourished them with honey from the rock and olive oil from the stony ground. He fed them yogurt from the herd and milk from the flock. It says, together with the fat of lambs. Then it says, he gave them choice the choice rams of Bashan and goats, and together with the choicest wheat, you drank the finest wine made from the juice of grapes. You'll see in this song what he's doing. He keeps using certain words like choicest and the fattest and the best. He's saying, you're about to walk into this promised land, and this promised land is going to be really good, thankful, thankfully for for strong men who have led you here. You see, there's something special about putting words into lyrics of a song. If you really want someone to remember something, right, we're really good at remembering song lyrics. Am I right? We can think of song lyrics often faster than we can think of, you know, passages of Scripture sometimes. And it's just like, man, you put something to music and our brains have this ability to remember it. And so Moses puts this truth into a song And you'll notice some of the goodness he talks about in that verse. He says, listen, you're going to get protection when you go into the promised land. You're going to get guidance. You're going to have provision. You're going to have nourishment. You're going to have abundance. Notice he doesn't just say you're going to have wine. He says you're going to have the finest wine. He doesn't just say you're going to have meat. He said you're going to have fattened meat from the choicest of 
of the animals. He, he doesn't just say you're going to have wheat. He says you're going to have the choicest wheat. He doesn't just say you're going to have a burger. He says you're going to have In-N-Out burger. <laughs> I might have added that in, but that's, here's my point. He says you're not just going to experience good okay times. You're going to experience good, good times, amazing times. Because you've had a strong man and men and people leading you, you're now going to step into a season of goodness. You see, what Moses is saying in the song is you are being led into really good times. So here's the part of the cycle where things start to turn. All right, here's the third phase of this cycle. You ready? Good times create weak men. Good times create weak men. Now, I don't think I have to to really convince anybody in this room that this is true. You look over history, and what happens when people are living in really good times, when they're living in abundance, when they have access to the choicest wine, the choicest wheat, the choicest meat, they become fat, right? It says that they become, uh, the, the, the abundance, the, the comfort, all that, they just kind of sit in it, enjoy it, and it turns a culture and a people into to weak people. You know, it's really interesting, but when God goes to Moses and says, Moses, you're going to go up on the mountain and you're going to die, in that same kind of dialogue between God and Moses, he says, Moses, and, and he goes on, he says, and after you're gone, these people are all going to turn on me. You see, we, we recognize this pattern that comfort leads to weakness. If we go and pull up that verse again in Deuteronomy 31, verse 20, remember it says, For I will bring them into the land I swore to give their ancestors, a land flowing with milk and honey, and they will become prosperous and eat all the food they want and become fat. Now we add on to that verse. You ready? But they will begin to worship other gods. They will despise me and break my covenant. You see, if you keep reading, that's where it leads. They will begin to worship other gods. They will despise me and they will break my covenant. You see, good times create weak men. Will you say that with me? Good times create weak men. Let's say that again. Good times create weak men. Now, as we look at some of the lyrics of the song, I think you're going to see some definitions of what a weak man looks like, what a weak woman looks like. And here's one of the things... uh, Point A there is weak men worship the things of this world. Weak men, instead of worshiping the one true God, they instead worship the things of this world. They, you're going to notice that that's true not only from this account, but in today's day and age. Weak men worship a bank account. They worship success. They worship power. They worship the, the next thrill, right? They'll worship uh, the next orgasm. They'll, they'll worship whatever it takes To just be able to, listen, good times will create weak men who will ultimately pursue other gods instead of the one true God. Here's another thing that weak men, weak men break their promises. We see this in this passage as well. Remember, God says that you will... He says, you will break my covenant. The song lyrics continue in verse 15. It says, but Israel will soon become fat and unruly. The people grew heavy, plump, and stuffed. But they abandoned the God who made them. They made light of the rock of their salvation. And that really shows us the third thing, that weak men are lazy self-consumers. Weak men and weak women, what they do is they essentially sit around with all the comforts around them. They're sitting in good times, right? They have access to the choicest things. And what do we do when we're living in good times? We just consume it. And we consume it for our own happiness and for our own pleasure and for our own joy. Weak men become lazy self-consumers. And then it goes on in verse 18. It says, you neglected the rock who had fathered you. You forgot the God who had given you birth. See, as Moses is writing this song, 
He's saying, listen, you're going to go into this land, and it's going to be really good. And then as soon as you have access to all these good things, you're going to become weak, and you're going to become uh, uh, full of all these comforts and all these things. And then he gets to this place where he says, you will eventually neglect the rock who had fathered you. You're going to forget the God who had given you birth. And that kind of leads us to this fourth idea is that weak men neglect spending time with God. Weak men, instead of recognizing the beauty and the importance of spending time with God, they get so caught up in the the comforts and joys of this world that they neglect spending time with God. So we have this, this cycle, right? Hard times create strong men, and strong men create good times, and good times then create weak men, and we get to this last phase, which is this. Weak men create hard times. Now you'll notice here that the cycle will now repeat itself. That there's a point at which hard times will raise up strong men. But we'll get to that in just a moment. Let me show you the hard times that these weak men are going to create. Remember, Moses is writing this song, but he's writing it from a future perspective. He's telling them, you're going to cross in, and then this is what's going to happen. It hasn't happened yet, but he's telling them, you're going to abandon me, right? You're going to neglect spending time with me. You're going to get fat and comfortable, and he says all these things. And then we get to Deuteronomy 31, verse 29. It says, I know that after my death, this is what Moses is saying to the people, I know that after my death, you will become utterly corrupt and will turn away from the way I have commanded you to follow. In the days to come, disaster will come down on you, for you will do what is evil in the Lord's sight, making him very angry with your actions. See, this is that uh, concept of weak men. And then let me show you in Moses' song in Deuteronomy 32, verse 20. These are some lyrics. It says, he said, I will abandon them. This is God speaking in the song. God said, I will abandon them, then see what becomes of them. For they are a twisted generation, children without integrity. Can you imagine, uh, if you're really trying to define what a, 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 a hard time looks like. I'll tell you what a hard time looks like. It's when the God of the universe abandons a people to just do what they want to do. That's what a hard time looks like. He's not saying, by the way, I'm going to abandon you forever. He's not saying, I'm going to leave and you're no longer my people. He's saying, I'm just going to let you guys do things your way for a season until strong men are raised back up. You know, kind of a way to think about this, if you're a parent in this room, there's probably been a moment before where you've been trying to help your children with something. Imagine for a moment, I I don't have a firsthand experience with this exact illustration, but imagine for a moment you're helping your kids bake something, okay? And you're, you're baking, and they're telling you the whole time, I've got this, I don't need help, and you're trying to, to offer some suggestions. You see them reach over for the salt when they're supposed to be reaching for the sugar. And you want to say something, but they say, no, 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 I don't want to do things your way. I got this. And what would be maybe a good thing to do as a parent at that moment is just say, you know what? Fine. Go ahead. Make your cookies. I'm going to abandon the project at this moment and let you see what happens when I'm not involved in helping you do it the right way. I'm just going to let you do things your way. Go ahead. See what happens. Right? And those cookies come out of the oven. You've probably got your camera rolling. You're like, ooh, let's taste them. Let's see what you've created. And what God is simply saying here is I am going to abandon you because you're going to be so uh, so weak, and you're going to create such a terrible time that in that, in, in, to bring about that bad, hard time, I'm going to abandon you to see what your weak people come up with. You know, there's another place in Scripture, in the New Testament, where we see this concept of God saying, I'm going to abandon you, and it's in the book of Romans. Go ahead and stay where you're at in the Old Testament, but let me read these verses to you. In Romans 1, verses 18 and 19, it says this, but God 
shows his anger from heaven against all sinful and wicked people. You could replace that with God shows his anger from heaven against all weak people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. And it goes on in verse 24. It says, so God, in those moments, abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. I love how this verse basically says, there's a point at which God is just so disgusted. He says, listen, if you want to put salt in your cookies instead of sugar, go for it. But you're going to see that as I abandon you to do things your way, you're going to create something really, really disgusting. If you look back in Deuteronomy, you're going to see in verses 22 and 25 I don't want anyone to miss this. Hey, if I've been going a little too long and someone's kind of tuned me out, tune back in for just a moment. I don't want you to miss what the Bible, this is Old Testament, says a hard time looks like. Are you ready for this? Verses 22 through 25, we find out that in hard times when God abandons his people, you're going to see fires, you're going to see natural disasters increase. You're going to see famines and food shortages. You're going to see fevers and other deadly diseases. And you're going to see war. Anyone need help figuring out what phase of this cycle I think we're in right now? I believe with all of my heart that we are in the phase of the cycle right now where weak men have created hard, difficult times. Now listen. Listen. I want to be really clear on this. At some point, as this cycle turns and turns and turns, at some point, things are going to get so bad that God is going to tell Jesus, now's the time. I want you to go back and end it all. I don't want this cycle to repeat itself over and over again anymore. It's gotten so bad this time that we're just going to call it quits. And we're going to go in and bring an end to all of it. Now, listen, I don't know what if this is, the, this is the cycle season that Jesus is going to be like, all right, this is it. For all I know, that, you know the, this week time, this, this hard time that we're in right now is going to bring about some strong men. And we're going to see another reiteration of this. Or maybe three or four or a thousand. I have no idea. Only God knows when he's going to tell Jesus to come back and end it all. But we do know that the season we're in is one of those seasons of, of hard times. And Moses' song shows this cycle so clearly. He shows that there's going to be strong men who bring about good times. And that, that good times, right, are going to create weak men. And that weak men are going to create hard times. And then we get into the book of Joshua. I'm going to give you a real brief rundown of what happens in the first four chapters of Joshua. We're talking like the, the 60 second version. You ready? In Joshua 1, 1 and 2, it says, after the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River and into the land I am giving them. In other words, what he says to Joshua is the wander years are over. Moses is now dead, and it is now your turn to take the people and lead them into the promised land. Moses has already written a song about the cycle of what's going to happen once they get there. But now's the time to start that. And then in Joshua 2, we see the story of Rahab, the prostitute protecting spies. And then Joshua 3 and 4 we see that God stops the Jordan River as the people cross the Jordan River into the promised land. A place Moses never gets to experience. A place that anyone, remember when God said anyone 20 years of age or older, you're gonna drop dead in the wilderness. All those people are dead and gone now too. This new young generation crosses across the Jordan River and into the promised land. Joshua chapter three and chapter four. 
So the wander years are finally over. God's people are now stepping into the next phase of this cycle, into the promised land. Now, that brings up a question I want to ask, which is what do we do with it? What now, God? I hope it's a question you ask yourself every Sunday. God, what do you want me to do with this content? As your word has been opened and as we're looking at the truth of who you've revealed yourself to be, what should we do with this? And here's the one thing I want to point out to you. The Bible's really clear that we as a people have the ability to control the pace of this cycle. We have the ability, listen to this, to decide at what point strong men raise up. We have the ability to decide once strong men are raised up and good times come. We have the ability to last in that phase of the cycle of good times for as long as we like. But there's some ways to make that happen. You see, after the song's over in, in Deuteronomy 32, verse 47, it says, these instructions are not empty words. They are your life. You ready for this? By obeying them, by obeying these instructions, by obeying them, you will enjoy a long life in the land you will occupy when you cross the Jordan River. In other words, if you want to live in good times, if you want access to all that, that the land flowing with milk and honey, if you want access to the choicest wheat and the fattened lamb and all those, if you want access to that, you get to decide. If you obey them, you enjoy a long life. And then God says this to Joshua in chapter one of Joshua, verses six through eight. He says, be strong, Joshua, and courageous. For you are the one who will lead these people to possess the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. You see what, what's repeated? Be strong and courageous. Then he says it again, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night, so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in everything that you do. If you, if you want to understand the true key to strong men and for strong men to create good times, it has everything to do with understanding and reading and spending time obeying this book right here. Yesterday was a good sports day for my family. We, we watched the Orioles win, beat the, the athletics of Liberty football was successful as well. It was, a, it was a good night. But hey, one thing I noticed recently, we were watching an Orioles game and Jorge Mateo, I, I, we, they zoomed in on him at one moment while he was out at shortstop and he pulled up his glove and written on the side of his glove, it said Joshua 1.9. I'm like, I'm about to preach on Joshua 1. Here's what Joshua 1.9 says. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Don't miss this. This is the third time that Joshua has received this command from the Lord. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The reason why this word strong has come up three times is God is reminding Joshua, listen, strong men create and sustain good times. So what can we learn? Here's, here's your what nows. Be careful to obey. Do not deviate to the right or left. Study the Bible continually. Meditate on God's word and teach the Bible to your children. Joshua 1.8 says, only then will you succeed in all that you do. You see this book right here, this book has the power to change your life. This book will help you in your interactions with your spouse. This book will help you in your interactions with your family. This book will help you be a better parent, will help you be a better employer, a better employee. This book has access to all sorts of powerful truths that will change your life so much for the better. 
This book tells the story of a God who loves you so much that he sent his son to this earth to die on the cross in your place so you can have access again to righteousness and access through righteousness to a relationship with God the Father. This book tells that story. Listen, sticking to this book will change your life. That's what Moses' song is about. That's what God tells Joshua. He says, listen, know this book, study it, know it, pass it along. You get to decide when, when strong men raise up. You get to decide when strong men create good times. You get to decide how long those good times last because as soon as you stop studying this book and caring about its contents, good times are going to then create weak men. Teach this book to your children. Obey its commands. Stick to the Bible. Remember Deuteronomy 32 verse 47 says, these instructions are not empty words. They are your life. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that you are good enough to us that you provided a revelation of who you are to us in this copy of your word. You've told us exactly what you want us to know about you. You haven't told us everything. There's so much about you we don't understand and know. But what you have revealed to us, we have access to it. We can read it. We can meditate on it. We can spend time in it. And doing so, God, we can not only apply it to our lives and obey it, but we can pass it along to our children and to our children's children. God, we get to decide when strong men in this church are raised up. And we know that those strong men will create good times. God, and we pray that you would help us to sustain good times by spending time in your word instead of getting fat on the comforts of this world. We love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings at 9 and 11 a.m. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.